Best Utes arriving in 2023, Australia's never-ending love affair with the Ute continues next year. From big units like the Ford F-150 to Volkswagen's take on the Ranger uh, Ford Ranger formula, we're covering the Utes to look forward to in the near future. Welcome, I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James Cleary, and joining me on the podcast panel to look at six significant 2023 Ute arrivals are our senior journalist, Richard Berry. G'day and Managing Editor, Head of Video, Matt Campbell. Hello. Uh, we'll also cover off this week in news and take a look at the fresh metal we've been steering in cars in the garage, so stay with us. Okay, we've been looking at a Byron Matthew Darkus story, which focuses on the headline ute scheduled for a 2023 launch in Australia. Um, and he makes the point in the story that there is just no denying our never-ending love affair with the ute. Um, in the top 10 sales, month to month, typically four of them. Uh, pickups, or, or as we like to call them, utes. And 2022 has been a big year. We saw a new Ranger, new generation Ranger, which was huge. Yeah. And the Hilux was updated. So there's been a lot happening. But Matt Campbell, uh, the first one that Byron's mentioned is related to the, the Ranger. It's the Volkswagen Amarok. It's due in the first quarter of next year. It's going to be a really interesting car. A couple of little differences to the Ranger as well under the skin. Yeah, yeah, and uh, looks different, which is uh, an important element uh, to the recipe as well. I think um, maybe personally, uh, the pictures that I've seen of the Amarok, the new generation one, I don't find it quite as appealing as the previous generation, the first generation Amarok, um, but maybe it'll look better when I see it in the metal. Um, it is a very important vehicle for Volkswagen Australia in particular. Um, Volkswagen Australia has a pretty big say on what happens with Amarok because um, basically it's the biggest market for that vehicle. Yeah. Um, and the new generation model, uh, instead of being built in Thailand alongside the Ford Ranger, it's actually going to be sourced from South Africa. Africa, yep. uh, where it also will be a pretty important player in that market. Um, yeah, like you said, uh, a couple of changes, uh, but a couple of similarities as well. Um, turbo diesel engines, of course, um, potentially uh, manual and petrol as well, um, and also a three litre V6 turbo diesel. Now, the three litre V6 diesel is actually a Ford engine, not the yeah. Volkswagen TDI engine. Um, we've had a fair bit of commentary on that. Um, on anything that we've done around the Amarok, people aren't necessarily happy about that um, because the V6 TDI has been such a strong engine for that uh, current generation Amarok. Yeah, awesome. And isn't there a, a 2.3 litre four cylinder turbo petrol is going to be an Amarok only kind of thing? Yeah, unless Ford decides that they actually should do that as well. Well, okay. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, at, the, at this point in time, 2.3 litre four cylinder is uh, set to come. Uh, petrol, turbo, it's yep. going to have heaps of power and torque for a, a petrol ute. Yep. Um, but it's it's proof that not everyone is uh, diesel centric uh, in the ute segment. And I think it's an important one because uh, if you look at all of the competitors to uh, Amarok in that sort of mid size, as they call it, S, uh, four wheel drive ute space it's yep. diesel centric um well, so well i was going to say what do you reckon richard with the diesel mm. versus petrol you know ranger versus amarok if you're if you're a tradie and you want to use it for work but also some some family duties as well what's the difference what do you, what do you what's your thought processes when you're assessing a ranger versus the amarok given they're so similar under the skin they are um but i really think these are aimed at two different types of buyers I think petrol offers a much smoother, uh, seamless uh, drive. Uh, I reckon if you're going to be towing, you should definitely be going. If you're being, sorry, if you're going to be towing a lot, you should be going for the diesel. It's got a lot, got a lot of low down torque. Uh, but I reckon the people that will be choosing an Amarok might be more your recreational style buyer. They probably aren't going to be towing a three and a half ton Jayco behind them uh, mm -hmm. very often anyway. Um, and look, I think. Volkswagen have chosen a right partner to do a joint venture with because that Ranger is super smooth anyway. So it's a premium product, JC. Yeah. So yeah, do, definitely. Do you, speaking of Jayco, do you find yourself spotting Jayco caravan names? I do. Yes, I do as well. There's, one. There, there's a whole series mm. of birds, aren't there? Like it's the, the yeah. Jayco the Pelican. Golden, golden Wing and yeah, all that. That's yeah, it. <laughs> no, Let's not just be Jayco centric, guys. There are a no, lot of caravans lot of out there. Yeah, there are. Two true. Two there true. are. The Sundowner. <laughs> is that one? Is that I don't one? know. Um, I'm, I'm not that it. into it. 
Um, anyway, <laughs> the, the, the next one, uh, Richard, get your thoughts on this one. It's a big deal. Oh, um, yeah. Mid-2023, mid and in mm. more ways than one, it, it's mm. big in terms of the noise it's going to make in the market, and it's a big mm. thing. Yeah. Ford F-150, it's been on sale in Australia at various times yes. uh, throughout its life, but it's making a comeback. Uh, hey. And it's going to be aiming straight up at the Ram 1500, the Chevy Silverado, um, and all of that. Big deal, eh? Absolutely. We've seen how popular the Ram's been. Um, F-150 coming to Australia, it's huge news. Um, it's a full-size truck, as they call it. So it's yeah. one level above a Ranger and a Hilux and a Navara. Yeah. Um, it's going to be interesting seeing what's sticking. It's bum sticking out in car parks at Bunnings and places like that because it's it is, it's a pretty long vehicle. But it's actually the smallest, or you know, one of the smallest in the F truck series. You know, it goes all the way up to two fifty, three fifty, all the way up to like. And you get up to Julie's and things yeah. with a fifth wheel yeah. platform on them. Yeah. Uh, unreal. I love all that stuff. But yes, we're just getting the one fifty. Yep. Yeah, in, in the United States it's the standard size truck it's not actually seen as a as a large truck at all it's a beginner's yeah. it's an entry-level truck you go there and it's like holy crap yeah <laughs> the size of yeah. these pickups but um, the yeah. other thing the other thing i was just going to say about the size of them the u.s roads and parking spaces are so much wider yes. than yes. australian roads and parking spaces there's going to be trouble with some of uh -huh. these big utes arriving well, i was i was behind a ram trx on the harbour bridge in sydney not long ago, and I was just watching. I could sense the beads of perspiration coming off this person's <laughs> forehead when they're trying to keep it in the lane. Um, yeah, it's it's big. What's the difference between American sized lanes and Australian lanes? Is there a difference? Does anybody know? I don't well, know. the the a bit of trivia. The Cybertruck was um, basically yeah. almost ruled out because Australian roads were too narrow. That's right. Um, I think it is not coming to Australia because of that. They yeah. asked for the road rules. <laughs> <laughs> to be, you know, the rules to be changed, so wow. and, and lanes to be made wider, so the Cybertruck could arrive. Well, here's another right. fun fact, which wow. is more urban legend. When Merck was developing the W140S class, they had to make it a bit slimmer because if they didn't, it would have been taxed as a truck. Really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's urban. That's probably an urban myth. Um, but yeah, I suppose it's a valid thing, isn't it? Um, it's going to have a massive uh, twin turbo V6, uh, 3.5 liter, EcoBoost. It's going to be mega powerful. It could tow 4.5 tons. It's yep. going to, all the things that Ram has been owning in the market, mm. all of a sudden they'll have some big competition, not only with Chevrolet, which is still a niche player, but wow, Ford's coming into the into the pack. Yeah, but also petrol, um, which is the yes. big, the big yep. thing. No diesel for F-150 mm. um, yep. uh, because, you know, Americans don't really like diesel um, unless they're buying the next step up in the F-truck range. <laughs> um, yep. And, you know, the big, elephant in the room is the uh, lightning electric yes. version yeah. um which you know is is a highly likely prospect for australia at some point but it's a fair mm. way away i would say um and yeah like you know no hybrid per se but or is it a hybrid i can't even remember 3.5 yeah. liter petrol uh is a pretty punchy thing no doubt absolutely about that. i've got some Sorry, go, go, Richard. I've got some F-Truck trivia for you. Go for oh. it. You know Ford sell more F-Trucks. They sell over a million F-Trucks a year, which is more than the entire combined Australian car market sells in it's one unreal. year. It's unreal. Just in that one series. That I don't know whether you've seen it on, on the box. I watched uh, a doco on the Rouge plant, you know, Ford's longest mm. established plant, where the F-150 is currently made. The timing of its production is so precise because they have to make every second count yeah. to get as many of those things out the door as they which, can. Which talks to the fact that these ones will be built in left-hand drive, shipped to Australia, shipped to, yeah. and then rebuilt yeah. in right-hand drive exactly. because they can't they can't fit it in. Like they can't no. fit right-hand drive production into that plant. So yeah. mm. um, it's a, a interesting way of doing and, things. And we've we've theorised. I was checking out a Tung, Tung story, hundred uh, k. You know, yes. you've probably got to be ready to pay 100K. Oh, yeah. The, the entry point for the Silverado is a bit over 100 now. So that's the yep. kind of territory you're talking. People so, have got yeah. it. People there, you know, plenty of people have got it. As um, as Byron's, um, you know, local manufacturing story that we talked about in the podcast last week um, spoke about is that people who were into enthusiast, you know, uh, Falcon Utes and Commodore Utes and SS Commodores have moved into pickups and, totally. and Utes. So that's they've it. got it, you know. That's it. Mm. All right. Okay. That's good. Um, next one, wow, talk about top of the market, Hilux. So typically the best-selling vehicle in our market, but this is more your Halo version, the second half, uh, the GR Sports, so the whole GR, Gazoo, Racing, 
thing extends to yet another model, um, it's going to be big, higher, like ride height, wider wheels, accessories, all the things you'd expect. But Toyota is really in a, a, a more competitive market than it's ever been in. It's going to be really interesting with, I don't know what the supply is like for various brands, but if, um, you know, range of supply starts to pick up, the monthly sales results are going to make fascinating reading. Yep, 100%. I, I think the Hilux is in danger of losing its top selling um car crown or vehicle yep. crown in australia yep. um yeah like you say if they can get enough rangers into the market then ranger could easily uh, topple it um but also like as you said there's so much more competition in that market now than there was 10 years ago um you know whenever you talk to someone 10 years ago about what you they should buy they didn't even think they just bought a yep. Yep. Um, yes. these days you've got you know, 20 or so options to choose from, ranging from half the price of a Hilux SR5 all the way up to, you know, more yeah. than double it. So, yeah, 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 absolutely. It's going to be an interesting year, but you wouldn't bet against Toyota because as a sales and marketing machine, yeah, um, it's a pretty impressive beast. Who knows what they've got up their sleeve? Well, yeah. well Sean Henley, when I, had, when I was at the Corolla Cross launch, uh, sat down with uh, Sean Henry, Henley, which is the Vice President of Marketing at Toyota Australia, and he said, I asked the question, will Hilux be the number one selling car in Australia? And, of course, he said yes. Um, so <laughs> they are, they're not having many issues with supply of that car. Yeah. Um, they know how important it is. And for Toyota, being the number one car seller in Australia is a huge, huge thing. Deal. They yeah. have an event every year yeah, yeah. to get there. That's so true. And the, the other thing about the Hilux is it's old. Yeah. Um, it is It is really old compared to some yeah. of those rivals out there. 2015? Yep. Um, yeah, something like and that. And so, you know, it's towards the end of its life cycle. This yep. is the last thing that they'll probably do. They've just done the Hilux Rogue, um, which mm, we've got yep. a review on, on the website, yep. uh, which is an improvement, but it's more expensive and still has the old interior and all that stuff that you just can't get over. Nothing like competition uh, yeah. to, to drive mm. things forward. Speaking of which, we were just talking about Halo models. Mitsubishi has been watching all this going on and has decided to get in on the act. And with uh, with Walkinshaw, no less, in Victoria, uh, for a local um, Triton called the Extreme. So mm -hmm. when Extreme. you're talking about things like Ranger Raptor, Hilux GR that we just touched on, Nissan has its Navara Warrior. Now we're going to have a Triton that, that joins that party. It sounds pretty exciting. Yeah, um, and I think the the appeal with Triton has always been it's slightly more affordable than a lot of its rivals. Yeah. And if they can get the price on this one right, like if it's the same price as uh, a lower grade Hilux dual cab or something like that, right. you know, 55, 60K. Because the then, Rogue's about 70, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So if it, if it still maintains its competitive advantage that it's always had yeah. of being more affordable and also that conditional 10-year warranty is getting a fair few buyers through the door as well, yeah. um, it's definitely going to have um, a place to fight its own little fight. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know if it'll look like the image that we've got um, and mm. if it does, there might not be everyone loving that, but uh, it's mm. certainly different looking. You know, the Ranger Raptor started all this, didn't it? Really, yeah. when it all oh. came down to it, it came out with something which looked like it was straight out of the, the Dakar rally. Um, and then everybody else tried to follow suit. Toyota came out with its GR. You've got the Extreme from the Triton. You've got the Warrior from, you know, Nissan Navara. Yeah. Yeah. I, was, I was behind a, a Raptor in the traffic yesterday. And seriously, the people who design the graphics scheme for that car, <laughs> right, are probably the same people who design the graphics scheme for my eight-year-old boy's pajamas. Oh. Because it's exactly. He's I thought you were going to say like a Monster Energy drink. No, or, you know, no, like it's that. so it's so okay. juvenile. It's so Unreal. juvenile. Like he's even got pajamas with like you know Raptor, not 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 the ford you know ranger raptor but it says raptor across his jammies okay it's the same thing it's just jammies for adults <laughs> all right <laughs> let's, let's let's keep going that's good so that's that's another big one now yes. um earlier on matt campbell you mentioned the elephant in the room and i thought you were talking about Not a me. gwm elephant you know the, 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 the names <laughs> oh, yeah. that we've had but the gwm mm. is actually in 2023 
going to add what's called in the in the domestic market for GWM the King Kong Cannon. Yes. Um, so it's a full size truck, just like we've been talking about, up against Ram and what will be in market sooner rather than later, the Toyota Tundra. Yep. Wait, Silverado. Wait, is that its name? It's called the King Kong Cannon. Which yes. puts me in mind of you King can't... Kong King Kong Bundy, who of course was a fantastic professional wrestler uh, oh, during the nineteen eighties. In the what United was his States. signature yet, move? Uh, eating the corner um, uh, <laughs> rail, I think. Um, <laughs> or that no. might have been might have been someone the animal steel who used to eat the ring. But uh, anyway, hang on. Um, what do you know? The, GWM the, the, do have the boxing ring. The rest. Oh ring. right, right. Yeah. GWM have got great names. So you've got. Yeah. Uh, the Aura, Aura Good Cat, the Aura Next Cat. You've got Coffee One and Coffee Two. They're SUVs. Yeah. So um, King Kong Cannon is yeah. five point six meters long. What? Um, like yep. that's that's a monster. And yep. yeah. you can only imagine that it's going to be uh, sharply priced. Let's say. Oh, yeah. Amongst mm. these full size things, so Ram at the moment starts at eighty three k for the Express, yep. which yep. is the older generation uh, vehicle. Yes. So that's sort of your point of entry at the moment. I can. Where, what do you reckon, Matt Campbell? Where might this thing land? It's got to be sixty k. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, fifty nine nine ninety drive away is where I'm sort of seeing that one. Are you, are you um, working for GWN now, Matt? Uh, Just, what's the warranty coverage like? Uh, no, if he puts one hand over his head, yeah, it's got a, no, no, it's got a King Kong side. King warranty. Kong. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I actually, if mm. uh, that's where I think um, strategically, if they were going to bring this vehicle in, like it says, you know, mm. they are saying they will. Um, mm. That's sort of the price point they probably need to be aiming at. Yeah. Um, you know, it's that point where you're still not getting the full fat Hilux, you're still not getting yeah. the full fat Ranger, but you can get a bigger Ute with more street presence and a crazy name for that kind of money. Like the 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 number of GWM Ute the Canon and Canon X and those models that we're currently seeing on the roads just shows that people are willing to roll the dice on a more affordable U. Yep. Um, 40 yeah. grand for most of those models, you know, that seems like pretty good buying. This one's, you know, it's not necessarily a full size up. It's just a, a, a step up in terms of size, but yeah. um, 5.6 meters long, nearly two meters wide. Um, it's a it's a big old thing. Well, I, um, I reckon, mm -hmm. I mean, further to what we we're saying, Utes are becoming the lifestyle choice and, you know, for young people particularly but by the same token if you are buying a dual cab ute to work in there's less badge sensitivity around that stuff you know you just want it to be priced right you want the spec to be right and you're oh. not so fussed about you might not be so fussed about you know what's on the grill in oh, terms of the badge so maybe there's a bit of that as oh, well it's been a long long time since i've been on a work site um but that's right, right. Well, I mean, yes i know that incident you and i jc used to work on a, a it work was site it was number it was number one on the news bulletins for several <laughs> nights in a row <laughs> it was but yeah. like do do other tradies like have brand snobbery do they go oh, yeah. look at yeah, you that's a fair your point. fancy yeah. highlights that's a fair point they, yeah, yeah. They're, cool. they're cool yeah. all right well look, mm. look on that note let's finish it mm. off GWN again, GWM again, um, they're going to add a cab chassis, uh, which will obviously increase the scope of their offering. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it'll be ultra competitive on pricing. So cab chassis, if ever there's a ute that's meant, meant to work, it's that, you know, put your own body on it. Yeah, mm. and you know we've seen in the past um, the likes of uh, you know Toyota with the Hilux Workmate four by two cab chassis at twenty five thousand dollars drive away. You've got the Isuzu D Max at thirty two drive away. Mm. Um, wow. So you yeah. know if if and you know there were days there where there was a, a petrol powered manual Nissan Navara. I think it was called the DX cab chassis, mm -hmm. um, and it was nineteen nine ninety. So that yes. was a long time ago. That was. But um, it but I, I, at be... the same time, I always remember thinking, how much metal for your money is that? You know, yeah. it was extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not saying that GWM will be aiming at that sort of price point, but they've got to be thinking mid 20s to low 20s. Like, you know, they have to be careful because um, there are several Chinese models which have priced a little bit too high and there's still a, cha a challenge of brand in this market. So, yep. yeah. Don't get cocky, kids. Good point. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Don't get cocky. Uh, mm. Nice Star Wars reference. Yes. Okay. The, the uh, that's it. That's the that's the top six, as it were, um, mm. of Utes that are heading our way next year. So uh, very interesting. But it's time to move on to this week in news, and some interesting stories are causing a bit of a, a click frenzy on the news section of our site. And Matt Campbell, 
Kick it off, Byron, what a surprise, has written a really compelling story around used options that might actually meet the needs of, of people that are shopping for current new models. Yeah, um, Byron and I often share text messages late into the evening about, oh, look at this bargain we found. And you're both so, in the same nightclub. Yep, yep. Yes. Um, and so, <laughs> I mean, you could just talk to each other right across the room. <laughs> we could, we could, but it's much more cool to do things by text these days. Got it. Um, and so we we often dream up about the the vehicles that we we would buy. I mean, I don't actually buy them. Byron tends to actually buy these cars a lot of he the does. time. He has a massive fleet of his own vehicles. So um, there's definitely uh, a bunch of bargains out there and and vehicles that are you know Australian made that have the Australian heritage, uh, you know, made for our market that maybe aren't getting as much attention as some of the other models that you know people want to reminisce about a bit more. So things like the TJ or TW Mitsubishi Magna and Verada, um, which, you know, I don't necessarily lust after one of those. I know Mitch uh, from our production team does, but um, there's there's definitely something to be said for Aussie cred. Uh, a Toyota Orion TRD is another wow. one on this list. Wow. Um, yeah. And yep, only 537 were made. Um, I wonder how many are left. Those uh, supercharged engines weren't necessarily known for longevity. Um, and when I see one in traffic, I always go, oh, geez, that's a cool car. Yes. That's yes. good. And, and I reckon um, people should go and, and have a look at the story because he's yep. mentioned some mm. others that, you know, um, what was it? The uh, Crewman is yes. essentially your oh. maverick. Uh, your Ford Maverick, the modern age, that kind of thing, but it's rear wheel drive. And it, all yes. that. anyway, so it's a good story. Um, thank, thank you for that, Matt. No now, Richard, yes, uh, we're going to move to another story, mm. which is about you know left hand drive cars. Should they be allowed to come into this market? Oh, another Byron Matthew Darkest. As in brand new ones, I should say. Yeah, yep. as in as in brand new ones. We're talking about buying a 1963 Chevy Bel Air, which I love, which is left-hand <laughs> drive. We're talking about a brand new car from the United States or somewhere else in Europe. Um, yep. The issue that we have in Australia is that you can't, you, you know, you, you're not actually allowed in some states to drive these on, on Australian roads or they're not even allowed to be imported by the manufacturer wholesale. So that rules us yep. out of F-150 unless it's been converted to a right-hand drive, which it is. Um, he in this story he lists and it's so infuriating he lists all the cars that we can't get because the manufacturers aren't just willing to convert it to, yeah. to right hand drive yeah. things like the ford bronco which i think is the most amazing little beastie american I, I would definitely want one of those but it's left hand drive only uh, things like the Ford Maverick, which we're talking about, Crewman, you know, was potentially yep. the original version of that. The um, pre, the precursor. Yeah. yeah, and the Maverick is a little Ute. Um, you know, if the Hilux is too big, a Maverick, which is sort of Ford Focus size, could be perfect for a lot of people living in the city. Ah, oh, there's so many sort of you know Dodge Challenger. There's you know, and endless the Atlas, Volkswagen Atlas. It's a seven seat it's, full size SUV that can't come to Australia because it's only left hand drive. That would it's be an ex it's an exciting thought. It's mm. an exciting thought, but the fundamental safety issue, of course, is vision. You know, when you when you're either oh. trying to pull out of a parking space or overtake I, a car on the I almost highway, died. It's, it's I almost died. I <laughs> almost died several times. If people don't know, you can see the image behind me. I love my old cars, but yeah. I have been driving a you know a 1964 Thunderbird. Um, on a you know left hand side of the road like we do in Australia, and you know what? When you're overtaking, you can't see if anything's coming. It's dodgy, yeah. That incoming yeah. lane, so you're doing yeah. this, yeah, and yeah, almost wiped out a couple of times just on one trip to Newcastle. So I yeah, get it. It's, it's so free and easy when when mm. Britain was in the European Union, just you know mm. hit the hit the channel. Yeah. And off you are onto the continent in a right-hand drive car in a left-hand drive environment. I reckon there must be just mangled wrecks everywhere because it's <laughs> For so sure. Dodgy. Like anyway, a it's, it's an in, in, oh sorry, go Richard. secret. I converted my American car myself from left hand drive to right hand drive. Oh dear, let's yes. move on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Very oh, easy, fantastic, fantastic. The dashboard. Uh, Got to just do that easy. I'll I'll, um, yeah. I'll finish this off on the news front with a Chesto opinion story. That alone tells you that you should oh, go to the site yes. and have a read. Um, it's mm. to do with Tesla and the prospect of a Model 2, and it being what Chesto believes will be Australia's cheapest electric car. He says, uh, you know, his early visions of, of 
uh, Elon Musk's stretching the truth in terms of the promises versus delivery kind of factor. Mm. Um, he's now willing to believe that the Model 2 will happen. Tesla is no longer a fly-by-nighter. It's established. It's a force globally. It's caused everyone even, from... Even though I predicted three years ago that it wouldn't be around in two years. That's right. We all did. <laughs> we all did. I think we're all on that bandwagon. Um, but, you know, to finally have... You, you've got to drop 60K on an EV now. That's sort mm. of the, the, the price where it's at. But um, given the importance of the goal of creating a cheap electric car, Chesto believes that Tesla will now do it. And when it comes to Australia, it'll it'll be the cheapest vehicle available here. So have a read just, of that one. I'll, I'll yes, just counter that with my uh, with a live opinion here Ooh, on that. Okay. Um, I think the cost of cars is increasing. Um, that is yes. yeah. petrol, petrol, diesel, otherwise. Yes. Um, and we already have two very, very affordable electric cars in Australia, the BYD Atto, Atto. 3 oh, yeah, good point. and the MG ZS EV at $45,000-ish, drive away for both of them-ish. Yep. Yep. Um, and uh, I think that realistically, 45K is affordable these days for a right. lot of people out there. Not no if it's your first car. Well, <laughs> How if it's your first, to, if it's your first car, you're going to have to max out those credit cards. How do you, no. How do you get a first car that's electric? How do you well, want to see, people want to spend ten grand yeah, on their first car? There's not oh, much in the way of second hand ten grand electric cars, but there are companies mm. like the Good Car Company that are importing grey import vehicles, uh, EVs, so you can mm. buy them more affordably because oh, okay. they realise that there are um, definitely uh, desires of people out there who just want yeah. an electric car, but they can't justify. 45, 60, I, I, I reckon 000. there'd be a beaten up Mitsubishi Imiev uh, out there for 10K. So yeah. Might not be registrable. I've been looking. No, they're oh, have you? at this point in time. Yes. What about conversions? Matt, I reckon you'd be doing the conversion thing for people. I would, on electric. the side. Yeah. yeah on just, the side. In, just in the front yard. Here. <laughs> That's horrendous. I don't want to even talk about it. AAA that. batteries, will I do? No, no. All right. Well, that's that's the news. Head to our site, have a look at those stories for all the details on each of them. But they're some of the stories that are clicking pretty well this week. Um, now we'll move to cars in our garage, the actual cars that we've been driving. Richard, yes, a new brand and a new model. Fill us in. Top line rundown on this car, please. Oh, this is the Cupra Formentor. Not Fermenter, Formentor. Um Fifty-three thousand uh, seven hundred and ninety dollars. Uh, it's it's not cheap. It's a Volkswagen. So you may have remembered from a few years ago there was a brand called Say It in Australia. It was written Seat. Uh, yep. That's not how you say it. You say it. Say it. <laughs> um, and Cooper was Say It's performance division. Now they're giving it another go in Australia under the Volkswagen umbrella. Um, so yeah, just their performance cars. They're called Coopers. Uh, you've got the Leon, which is kind of like a golf-sized hatchback. And you've got a Formenta, which is not quite Tiguan sized. Um, it's more like a golf SUV. Um, okay. okay. But great. Quick uh, to drive, 400 newton meters, very fast off the mark. It looks great, um, but no one knows what it is. Mm. <laughs> okay, superb. <laughs> Lovely. Beautiful thumbnail. Thank mm. you. Um, now, Matt, you've been driving something um, not necessarily aligned with the Cupra. It's almost in a world of its own. Well, in some ways it's aligned. Oh, no, it's, no, it's not. That's absolute rubbish. Sorry, I take all that back. You're about to contradict all of that. It's quite quite <laughs> expensive. Um, it is an SUV and it has a lot of performance on its side. It is the Aston Martin DBX 707. Uh, 707 standing for 707 horsepower, um, which is 520 kilowatts or 900 newton metres uh, of torque wise. Um, that's from a four litre V8 twin turbo petrol engine with a nine speed auto all wheel drive not to 100 3.3 seconds that's quick um it's very 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 fast mm. um yep. the vehicle that i'm driving is in plasma blue uh cool. which is a, cool. an interesting hue the mm. it's got two-tone interior so onyx black and cote d'azur blue and the interior color is spectacular but i'm really surprised that it doesn't quite match the exterior color now this oh. car um is not cheap. Um, the vehicle I'm testing, including all the options that it's got, uh, some of the options including the metallic paint, um, the uh, Q semi aniline leather palette interior, power tailgate with gesture control, um, interior jewelry pack 
Um, what does that yeah. mean? So it's got what uh, does that mean? two by two carbon fiber. It's got a belly button trim. ring, does it? Yes. Uh, <laughs> contrast stitching, smoke tail lights, um, carbon Sweet. fiber gloss trim inlays, and 23 inch forged Holy. alloy wheels. 23 inch. 23s. That's yeah. as big as they go, isn't it? Audi puts 23s on some things, but yeah. that's huge. That's yeah. ridiculous. Um, that's borderline so- donk. <laughs> yeah and the funny thing is they barely fill the arches on this thing it's, oh wow. it is it's quite the the um head turning vehicle but so is the price um five hundred and twenty eight thousand um before on-road costs wow. uh, for the vehicle i'm testing and if you're wondering about wow. the fuel consumption figure 20.8 liters per hundred is the wow official. that's the claim so wow. you're in the, the high 20s combined. in the matt, blink of an eye matt can i just ask i um i drove the dbx earlier this year or was it last year? I don't know. It all last year. Uh, leans yeah. into one. Last year. Um, I wasn't particularly impressed with the way it drove. Like, very fast and, you know, um, handled well. But um, around town, I wasn't too impressed. What, do you, what are your thoughts? The uh, air suspension is, it, it can sort of feel like you're sort of constantly doing these ones, which is uh-huh. like a bit of a wiggle on your butt. Yes. Um, yes. Which, mm. I, I mean, that's, partly that's to your do signature fact, move. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's it what is. I was known for in Kuma back at the that's club. Right. Yes, that's, that's right. right. Um, the yeah, bum the, wiggle. But the, the, bum. <laughs> the, the I think it's got a lot to do with having 23-inch wheels yeah. um, and, yeah. you know, an air suspension setup that's more uh, mm. angled towards performance air suspension than comfort air suspension. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So it is definitely um, a weapon. There's no doubt about that. The thing's fast. Yeah. Um, but I... I don't know whether, you know, for example, you might be getting a more luxurious drive experience in something like an X5M yeah. or uh, even a GLE 63 or GLS 63. Yeah. Um, yes. See, it was probably tested on the Nürburgring, but not around the streets of Camberwell or Redfern yeah. or yeah. Perth, Adelaide Hills, was it? Yeah. Mm. Reality may yes. not have factored in. No. All right. Well, I mean, yes. And at that price too, it's only a reality reality for a few people. Yes. Um, <laughs> so that's brilliant. What an experience. I'll, I'll thank you, Matt. I'll finish us off. Similar vein, uh, Land Rover Defender. It's the 110, so the long wheelbase P525, which is 525 metric horsepower, supercharged V8, five-seat SUV, 220 grand. So it's a bargain. It's, it's hard. Relatively. You know, it's making my Cupra look price. more and more affordable every time you guys uh, talk. <laughs> so that 525 horsepower metric is 386 kilowatts, 625 newton metres. It's four-wheel drive, of course, eight-speed auto. Mm. The pluses are it sounds and looks tough. And the one we had was triple black. So black exterior, interior, rims, the whole thing. Um, 0 to 100, 5.4. So it's totally sluggish. Um, it's actually really, really rapid yeah. and comfortable. It's on 22s and it rides really nicely. Yeah. The interior design and the materials, I like it. It's just my personal preference. You get a Dinamica suede steering wheel in a big, tough Defender um, mm. and sort of uh, these touchy-feely materials around the console and whatever. Um, there's lots of space. It's mm. close to flat floor in the back. It's got a lot going for it. Minuses, the turning circle big um lots of beeping you can turn it off of course but everywhere you go i'm just sitting in the middle of the lane and it's beep 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 showing you that other cars are around you that's annoying yeah uh 12.7 liters per hundred quoted so yes it's it's only sipping it compared to the uh, aston martin (laughs) 20 20 liters you're you're gonna you're gonna be in the high teens pretty quickly so Uh. filling it up will be um a sobering exercise i'd imagine yeah but for mine Mm. it's a it's a cooler Merc AMG G63. Yes. Um, and, a, and a G63 is 365K. Yeah. So yeah. you're saving more than 140 grand and having a car that, frankly, I'd probably prefer um, yeah. at, at a much lesser price. I love the look of the Defender. I'm a big Defender fan. Put my hand up to it. And this one is kind of the, the ultimate show off extension of it. I'd be happier with a short wheelbase on Steelies. But, you know, um, it, it was fun. It was fun to drive, cool. no doubt about it. But it doesn't have the G63's quad side exhaust. No, but it's that's, got quad rear cool. exhaust and it sounds yeah. amazing. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it it's got a lot of that going on. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you, JC. I think um, mm. it could be the perfect alternative to a G63. Yeah. More livable, I would argue, as well. Um, yeah. That's and, a, you know, super comfy, really practical, lots of yeah. storage and all that. Yeah. Yeah, cool. all right. Looks good. Okay. And it stayed, it's that, that car has stayed true to its roots in terms of the styling as well. I think they've done a really yeah. good job of it. Yeah. Yep. No. Mm. 
Mm. All right. Well, look, thank you, guys. With that, we've reached the finish line for this show and the Cars Guide podcast as we know it. What? Um, our team is looking at new formats and media channels. So this may be a case of see you soon rather than a flat out goodbye. But huh. for the time being, thanks to all our listeners and viewers, over 254 episodes. Um, Richard and Matt, we started this together five plus years ago. And thanks yep. for your efforts along the way. Uh, and to all the people who've joined the panel over that time. And of course, big thumbs up to our longstanding production guru, Mr. Pritchard. Uh, his sartorial elegance has risen to new heights today. Uh, he's wearing taco slippers, diamond sequin pants in champagne gold, mm -hmm. and a t-shirt saying, behold the field in which I grow my fucks. <laughs> Lay thine <laughs> eyes upon it, and thou shalt see that it is barren. <laughs> uh, remember you can contact cars guide on facebook twitter instagram tiktok and linkedin or traditionalists can email us at comments at carsguide.com.au but before we go mate of mine who lives in italy broke down next to a remote monastery late one evening he knocks on the door and says look my car's broken down do you think i could stay the night the monks accept him feed him even fix his car but as he's falling asleep he hears a strange sound. Next morning, he asked the monks what the sound was, but they say, we can't tell you. You're not a monk. My mate's disappointed, but thanks them profusely and, and heads off. A couple of years later, he breaks down at virtually the same spot in front of the same monastery. Same deal. Monks accept him, feed him, fix his car. That night, he hears the same strange noise that he'd heard years earlier. The next morning, he asks what it is, but the monks reply, we can't tell you, you're not a monk. Man says, all right, I must know. If the only way I can work out what that sound is to become a monk, how do I become a monk? The monks reply, you must travel to Matera and live with Brother Vincenzo in a cave for a year and not speak during that time. When you have done that, you can join our order. My mate seeks out Brother Vincenzo, lives in a cave with him for a year, and doesn't utter a word. He returns to the monastery and the monks say, congratulations, you are a monk among us and we will reveal the source of the sound. The monks lead the man to a wooden door where the abbot says, the sound is beyond that door. My mate reaches for the knob, but the door's locked. He says, may I have the key? The monks give him the key and he opens the door. Behind the wooden door is another door made of stone. My mate demands the key to the stone door. The monks give him the key and he opens it, only to find a door made of marble. He demands another key from the monks who provide it. So it goes until my mate has gone through further doors of bronze, silver, and finally gold. The abbot says, this is the last key to the last door. My mate, excited and relieved in equal measure, unlocks the door, turns the knob, and behind it, he is amazed to find the source of that strange sound. But I can't tell you what it is because you're not a monk. Oh, <laughs> James Cleary. <laughs> Thank you, James. Thank you for all the jokes. That was one of the best. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> Jason. Thank you for hosting this podcast. You are the host with the most. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good one.